is normal. Come on. I don't, there's not much more fanfare than that. The, 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 in, the announcements the, the, of somebody, the, uh, uh, the way to announce somebody, the more famous they are, the less you say. My shortest ever introduction was I got up there and I said Q, and it was Quincy Jones. So no, Norman's not Q, bad. Q. No, Norman's not bad. Yeah, he yeah. did his first book here. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, you can go, you can go on from there. <laughs> Uh, this is my first and last experience, I think, at a TED conference, uh, simply because I didn't know what they were. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm out of it. Uh, old, and uh, I make movies and tell stories and very rarely have the opportunity to do anything else except farm, which I love to do. I have a farm, and that's my passion, is my farm, because I come from a generation, many generations of farmers. So I like to grow things, and I like to watch them grow, because it's very basic. To plant something and watch it grow and flower and give you something and die is what I think life is about. And I think farming is something very essential and part of our nature. And this is why, as we look at the world about us, all living things are incalculably valuable. Whether it's a tree, a flower, a shrub, an insect, an animal, we all know how precious it is. And the older you get, the more <laughs> precious it becomes because you know that you are going to wither and die and leave this magnificent, wonderful place because this is heaven. Life is so goddamn exciting and filled with such joy and such <sighs> satisfaction. Whether it's sexual, whether it's food, whether it's procreation, whether it's watching your children, whether it's, what is it? I don't know. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful life, Frank Capra said. And he made a wonderful film about it. The reason I probably won't come back to another TED conference is the fact that I didn't know that it was a theatrical place. I, didn't, I thought it was a group of artists from different disciplines getting together and sharing ideas. I didn't know there was an audience. How many of you paid to come here? Raise your hand. <laughs> He's an American. <laughs> You've been had, kids. Boy, they know how to do it, don't they? They can even get all these great Canadian talent. All of these people, these, these people we all want to share and listen to, and they can bring them all together and 
make money. I wonder how much Moses is making at his writing here. Anyway, uh, I'll be grateful for all the checks that I'm sure will be sent to the Canadian Film Center, which is a center for advanced film studies, which is a passion of mine because it's about young Canadian artists, writers, directors, editors, who maybe have something to say. And it's time. It's time this country had a piece of the screens of the world. It's our time. I know it's tough. It's got 250 million of them down there. And I know Hollywood's big. And I know it controls and programs. They told me to dress down today. They told me not to talk about what I do for a living, but talk about my passion. They told me how long I would have. They told me when to be here. They told me all of these things. They programmed me. <laughs> and you, my friends, are being programmed. And you know it. We're being programmed every goddamn minute of the day. I can't get past 10.50 in the morning without a Starbucks. I gotta have a Starbucks. <laughs> and it's gotta be with 2% thing with the latte, the thing, the thing, the thing, and the cappuccino with the thing. And the have you heard these people? And everywhere you go, there's a Starbucks. Everywhere. They made money out of caffeine, man. They're just pumping us full of caffeine, and we love it. And the guy who tells you that his caffeine is the best, or the guy that keeps pounding at you long enough, you eventually give up, and you don't go to the little mom-and-pop store, and you don't go to your cappuccino maker and make a decent cappuccino. You go to Starbucks because they told you to, and they charge you three fifty. And you, my friends, have been had. Bullshit. I was talking to Galen Weston the um, uh, day before yesterday. Uh, there was a meeting for ban line landmines. And Canada, whether you know it or not, folks, has taken a leadership in banning landmines throughout the world. Every 22 minutes, some kid, some animal is blown to smithereens. There are millions of landmines all over the world, the borders of Egypt, the borders of Kosovo, all over Serbia, all over the world. Africa's loaded with them, seeded, some of them only this big. Millions of them, don't you know that? And thank God, um, what's his name? Lloyd Axworthy, our, our, our Minister for Foreign Affairs, had the guts to stand up and say, well, we got to stop this and we're going to do something about it and Canada wants to take some leadership and Bill Clinton didn't support it. And Bill Clinton's a friend of mine. I've slept in the White House. I've slept in the Lincoln bedroom. I have. And it was wonderful. <laughs> because I couldn't have made the ending of soldier story, which I shot in the state of Arkansas when Bill Clinton was governor, if it hadn't have been for him. And soldier story was an important film, an important film for America, an important film about discrimination and, and racial issues, and a, an important statement by Charlie Hill as a playwright and it deserved the Pulitzer Prize and but we didn't, nobody wanted to make it because it was a black picture. And in Hollywood, they don't want to make black pictures. Or how do you know? The 
because we're brainwashed, because we're programmed, and we're all being programmed. And I said, what am I going to do? I need 500 black troops to march down the street with pride and dignity. Glenn Miller's going to be playing in the background. Where am I going to get 500 black troops? I don't even have enough money to train 10. And I went to Mr. Clinton, who was the governor of Arkansas, and told him how important this film was for the people of America and for every young black kid and about the segregation of the army, how black citizens were asked to go and give their lives for a country that they couldn't even go and get a cup of coffee at Woolworths or go to the bathroom or drink out of a water fountain. Oh, but you can go and die for the country. America. Justice for all. Life liberty and the pursuit of happiness enshrined in the Constitution. Americans love to talk about the Constitution. They love to talk about the freedom of the citizen. Well, what about the freedom of minority? That's a group. What about the freedom of Jews? There were six million of them exterminated. What about them? What about old people? What about women? Every man should be given the right to life, liberty, to pursue. What about women? You know why? Because the people who wrote the Constitution owned slaves. And because women weren't important. So we got something called human rights. Because those are civil rights. And civil rights are very important in America. What's important to me is human rights, how we treat each other. And that's what this country stands for, and what we all should stand for. And every one of you should be adopting a minefield, and we should stand up for what is right, what is true. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about something that I feel strongly about. And I think that's what this conference is about. We should talk about something we feel strongly about. Time it. Whatever you do in your life, time it is going to be the most important aspect. To have the right timing. I was... In 1967, let me just tell you a quick story. In 1967, I was trying to make a picture uh, in America called In the Heat of the Night. And it was in the middle of the Civil Rights Revolution, in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement. Cities were being burned down. And Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and we all know, if you lived through the 60s, you know what happened. And I was, I was in um, Sun Valley skiing with my family, and my son broke his leg in a race um, just after he passed the finish line, thank God, because he's got the silver. And because um, we're very competitive. <laughs> and, uh, oh, they also said, when they, when they called me to do this, they said, uh, please be, uh, what was it? Please be, don't forget to be, um, what was it? The art of manipulation. Uh, don't forget to be, oh, um, what? Vulnerable. Don't forget to be vulnerable. If there's one thing that I looked at when I saw ev all the people who are going to speak here, there's one thing they are not vulnerable, believe me. <laughs> believe me. You think I need your approval? 
I'm an artist, for Christ's sake. I make movies. So you can see I'm not, I'm only vulnerable when I'm rejected. And that's the same as all of you. But we all share one thing. We all share a common end. We all share a love. Of, he doesn't even like movies. He said so today in the study. He doesn't even go to the movies. Well, what the hell are we doing here? Don McKellar, Adam McGoyan, what are we doing here? <laughs> the guy who's running this thing doesn't even go to the movies. Thank God Moisha Shafty goes to the movies. He talked to me about a movie, and he says, geez, I saw your last movie, The Hurricane, and he says, I went back and redesigned a federal courthouse. How about that? I said, you, I love you. Because movies do change us. That's why communication is so out of control at the moment. Don McKellar was talking about the internet. Isn't that scary? Isn't that fucking scary? What's on the internet? I mean, they can put you on the internet. They can put your picture and your, and your parents' picture and your kids' picture and say anything they want. What is that? God, I've never seen such an invasion of privacy. I'm scared. I am totally scared. I made a film some, oh, anyway, let me get back to the Sun Valley. I'm sorry I left you. <laughs> son broke his leg. Um, 20 minutes later, Bobby Kennedy's son broke his leg. Uh, we end up in the hospital as parents. I meet Bobby Kennedy for the first time, 1966. Excuse me. He, uh, I was nervous. He, uh, he said to me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm a, I'm a film director, and I'm, and I'm involved in making a film that's sold in the heat of the night, and it's about a black detective who gets stuck in a small Mississippi town, and, and there's, a, there's a redneck sheriff, and, and you know all the problems in Mississippi at the moment, and he is the smartest guy in town. And he has a suit. solves the murder and goes through a lot of <sighs> problems because of his color. And he, he slaps my leg back. And it's going to be the first time that ever happens in American cinema. Bobby Kennedy looked at me and he said, this could be a very important film, Norman. The timing, the timing is right. 1966, right? Make a long story short, he kept in touch with me. Um, he sent me a lot of research of young black students in the South and so on. And we kept in touch and a friendship developed. And I fell under his spell of his visions and dreams. The, the funny thing that happened was, or the curious thing that happened was, the film did come out. I was terrified. It was, they wouldn't even accept our ads in New Orleans and Nashville, whatever. But the film captured the imagination of the audience, and it won the New York Film Critics Award. And I went to New York to give the award, which is given out at Sardi's. Very small ceremony. It's not like the Oscars or anything. And who was giving out the awards but the senator from New York, Mr. Robert Kennedy. And as I went up to get the award, they said, the best picture of the year is in the heat of the night. And here he is, the director. And I came up to get the award. And he says, see, I told you the timing was right. <laughs> and we lost him. We lost him a year later in the kitchen at the Ambassador Hotel. And I was with Melina Mc at that moment of his death because we were going to meet him at 10.30 at John Frankenheimer's house. And Melina was in exile from the Duke 
junta, which had taken over Greece at that period. She later became Minister of Culture for Greece. Great woman, Elaine Coy. Anyway, it's time I ended. I wanted to leave you with, with a couple of just quick thoughts. Art, in my opinion, is not just painting a picture, sculpting a piece of sculpture, building a particular building, writing a particular book. It's, it's not about that. It's about ideas. It's the idea behind a piece of art that makes it special for us. And I like to think that I'm just a storyteller. And like most film directors all over the world, all we do is tell stories. And we tell it on the screen and on film, and film has become the literature of this generation. So it's an important part of the art. It's the ideas behind such art. When I made the film and the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. The word detente, the idea, the absurdity of international conflict was not being considered. Khrushchev was banging his shoe at the United Nations. You were in the middle of an arms race, and we were all terrified. And we made this comedy called The Russians Are Coming. And you know something? Again, Bobby Kennedy was right. The timing was right. Because it wasn't about capitalism. And it wasn't about communism. It was about people. It was about people pushed together, Russians and Americans, and somehow coming together and behaving like human beings. Because you see, we all do love each other. We all are connected. And never forget that. No matter how much you're programmed, no matter how many multinational, multi-global companies take over this world and your life, political, we've lost our confidence in our leaders and big business is taking over, folks. But don't let them program the love that you have for each other out of your lives. Don't let them program it out of your mind because the world is in desperate need of new ideas in life and new assurance and leadership. And I hope all of you go out and make a great movie. Okay. Thank you so much for coming.